Um, I, uh, I'm also um, a colleague of um, both Clive and uh, Phil Green in a little organisation called Onlinement. And I thought, as um, Clive was the one that brought up appearance, um, <laughs> I would just mention that um, if you look at the Onlinement team, I bring many things to the team, but the most obvious one is hair. <laughs> <laughs> Much overrated, I think. Yeah, so you Well, see. I know how much time you spend in the morning getting ready, you know, with the, getting just the right, you know, Just colours. the right look. Um, right, I want to talk to you about um, the actual sort of issues around selecting uh, content development tools. Hopefully you should see this linking quite nicely to the stuff that um, David has been talking about around strategy, because say, I was involved in some of the research activity that went into producing these papers, and spent a lot of time talking to contentual vendors and talking to end users and found some quite interesting things, particularly talking to the users. Um, also want to mention at this point that throughout this I will probably mention particular tools. If I do mention something, it's not a recommendation. If I don't mention something and you're using it, don't feel offended because I'm not saying that's not the right tool. I thought I should mention that because as I've been scurrying around downstairs having a look at everything, I've had various attempts to bribe me. Um, by the various vendors to sort of talk about um, their solutions as being the right ones. But it takes more than a handful of Murray mints and a USB stick to buy me. <laughs> Not much more. Not much, Not much more. more, no. <laughs> Had they tried two handfuls of Murray mints, we could be talking about one tool now. So David talked about some of the, um, the strategic things that are actually pushing people towards the idea of a, a more, a smarter kind of uh, content authoring strategy. But the other side of that is the changes to the market that are sort of pulling people towards this idea. And when you start looking at the, the authoring tools landscape, there are simply more tools. They're cheaper, they're more sophisticated, and at the same time, easier to use. You, know, you can buy some of these authoring tools for uh, under 500 quid. There are also, there are free options, there's open source options that are no cost. They all come in you know, varying different features and, and varying degrees of quality, but it's very, very easy to make that first step into getting a tool, which is often where you start to get into problems because it's so easy to just go out and buy the tool without having to put too much thought into it. So they have got more sophisticated in that you look at the output of some of these things like um, you know, Caspian's Thinking Worlds, where you're actually able to create these 3D virtual environments which, you know, five years ago, certainly ten years ago, you couldn't have imagined being able to do that kind of thing yourself on your desktop. You were probably in that situation, as David alluded to, where your content authoring was built around a copy of AuthorWare. But the problem was with that, you didn't just have to budget for going out and buying a copy of AuthorWare. You had to budget for going out and hiring someone on 30 grand a year who was going to be full-time sat in front of that actually building content for you. And that's just no longer a requirement. However, this is the problem. Because it's so easy, you know, particularly when you're talking about a tool that might be 500 quid, you're sitting in a large corporate. Actually, even in these difficult times, you, know, you can probably spend 500 quid without anybody particularly noticing. And that can just be a 500 quid ticket, something very disappointing. That's not to say that there's anything actually wrong with the tool. But the problem is, if you haven't matched the tool up to what it is you want to do, it's not going to work for you. And it can be a bit like a game of find the lady, sort of thinking about all the different things that um, you need to consider um, in your uh, purchasing process. But the key things are you know, matching up to your strategy. I mean, again, David's talked through all of the elements, the key elements around a strategy, but you, you've got to do that first. You've got to think about what is it we're setting out to do? What is it we want to achieve? What is it that um, we want as an end result of going out and buying a tool? You've got to think about skills. That's probably the single most significant issue that you're going to face, and I'll we'll talk about that a little more shortly. Um, you need to think about the desired outcomes in terms of what is it you want this content to be? What is it you want this content to look like? If you're currently using that, completely outsourced black box model of very expensive, very rich content, you can't expect to go out and buy a very cheap tool and do the same thing. You have to be clear in terms of what it is you want to do. 
and think about things like output formats and restrictions and all those kind of things. And you also have to think about budget. I'm not going to talk about budget particularly, but just bear in mind that pretty much everything that I'm going to talk about here has budget implications of some kind. Now, this is um, a very, very broad sweeping idea of the kind of tools that are out there. You'll find this is covered in more detail in the paper. Um, starting down there with generic web tools. So that's things like, um, historically, that was quite often things like front page, or be things like Dreamweaver or Flash, things that are not designed particularly for building e-learning. They are designed for web content, but can be designed for e using for e-learning content. Single author tools, that'll be things like Articular and um, Captivate, and more complex tools like Lectora. The collaborative tools, that's things like um, Mohive and Atlantic Link, where you've actually got things on a server and you can actually have multiple authors working from remote locations. And then up here, you've got learning content management systems, much more sophisticated, um, more complex approach to, to content development. But they are only very rough kind of points on here. Because the thing is, if you look at the generic web tools, companies like Adobe have recognized the fact that these things are great for building your learning content. So if you take Dreamweaver, you can get a free extension which will output your content as SCORM. You can also have um, this free extensions within Flash that will output it in SCORM format. So it's no longer just a generic web tool. It starts to become more of a single author tool. If you look at single author tools, something like Lectora is designed to be used on your desktop. But then you look at the latest version of that, which now allows you to actually not work as collaboratively as you would with some of the server-based solutions, but you can actually have a bunch of different authors, all that installed on their own machines, but actually connected across a network in terms of accessing assets and content. So they're all starting to blur together. And even at LCMS, you know, there isn't one type of LCMS. There's some quite straightforward e-content-focused LCMS solutions, and then there's much more complex solutions that are designed to handle every kind of learning asset. So there is this whole continuum of them. Look, it might even appear that we actually talked about this presentation before we put this together. That, or I just went through David's slides and looked for the good stuff. If we look at this side, this is all of the internally produced models. So down here, this is where we're talking about the single author tools, and it will tend to be the simple single author tools, the articulates, um, the Adobe Connects, and maybe to a degree things like Captivate. When you get up here to Local Rapid, that will still be the same kind of tools, but also more of the, um, the slightly more sophisticated ones like um, say Lector and, and so on. Distributed process and content factory, that's when we're definitely moving up into the much more sophisticated collaborative tools and also the um, LCMS solutions. As we come over this way more, well here, in the middle here with rapid partners and partially outsourced by task, that could be anything at all. And from the, the conversations we had with various users, we did find that in this area, there was no kind of set pattern in terms of the types of tool they used. It tended to be based more on what they knew and what they'd actually happened to go out and buy. And up there, we've fully outsourced, of course, the most likely um, situation is that you'll be working with the vendor's own tool, or the vendor is working with their own tool, which does give you the, the potential disadvantage of being locked into that vendor. What some people are doing, and again, David kind of alluded to this, is that some of the traditional vendors are now using a tool that's been mandated by the um, the user themselves. So that means that they can still get all the advantages of that fully outsourced approach, but still be able to maintain and update content themselves or move to another supplier if they want without any um, issues around uh, portability of the content. So I mentioned that uh, skills um, are important. And I think probably the single biggest influencing factor um, in terms of your tool choice. In broad terms, if you think about things like learning, so what skills do people need around learning? Do you want these people to be fully-fledged instructional designers? If they're building content, they're going to have to have some degree of instructional design skill. They need to be able to do things like storyboarding and script writing and that really simple little process of actually making sense of what subject matter experts provide you. 
you've got to think about design. And by design, I'm thinking about the visual aspects of stuff, the multimedia and so on. Because it is important where things are on the page and what things look like. Don't underestimate the power of good design to enhance the learning or of bad design to completely screw it up. You've got to think about the technical skills as well because all of these tools, you know, some of the ones I've mentioned, they're really very simple to use. They're very simple in terms of I want to export the content in this particular format. I tick this box for the version of Flash that I got. I tick this box for my LMS or this version of SCORM and so on. And nine times out of ten, it's going to work. Probably more than nine times. Ninety-nine times out of a hundred, it's going to work. But you do have to be prepared for what happens when these things go wrong. What happens when your company decides overnight to upgrade from IE6 to <coughs> IE7 or Flash Player 6 to Flash Player 8? And I know, because that's happened to me, where my entire suite of e-learning content across an organisation of 50,000 people was rendered useless overnight by someone in IT deciding to upgrade to Flash Player without telling anybody. You know, someone has to deal with these kind of things. You need to be aware of having some level of, of technical skill. And there's also all the other things, like project management. Now, project management is an important skill in getting any kind of e-learning content developed. Just giving someone a tool and saying, ah, knock out the content in your spare time, that's not a particularly strategic approach. You're not likely to get results without some kind of planning and management around it. And that includes you know, the, the dealing with the SMEs, the, the cat herding involved there. And there's a big question that comes up around skills, which is, do you go out and define the tool that you want and then decide what skills you want? Or do you look at the people around you and look at the skills they've got and then go and buy the tool? And in the conversations we had with users, we actually found both approaches had been used. And people would swear by both. I think it's one of those things that there is a, an instinct would suggest that the, probably the most sensible approach is wherever possible you are building the skill set around the tools that you purchase and you purchase the tools based on your development model and strategy. But if you are in a situation where you have got a highly skilled team that perhaps use Flash and Dreamweaver every day building web content and you're gonna, you want to move into e-learning, there is an argument that says perhaps it would make more sense to utilise the skills they've already got rather than go out and buy another tool. It's some of the, the duller stuff thinking about output formats. The stuff like, do you want HTML? Do you want Flash? You might decide that you do want your content to be in Flash. You want something highly interactive and really whizzy. But you work in a bank, and you've got a customised version of Mozilla 7 as a browser, and you're not allowed to have a page size of more than 4K, and you can't use X, Y, and Z, and so you can't have Flash. You've got to think about what you want and what you can do and the things that you must do, because certainly in a lot of organisations, particularly like, across all organisations, but particularly in the um, public sector, much more attention being paid to the accessibility of e-learning content. So thinking about being able to make your content accessible, accessible or any other specific requirements within your organisation is important. And producing content isn't just about producing e-learning content. It's not just about sitting down with that one tool, typing in some text and dragging some images. How do you get all that stuff in the first place? So, thinking about the media content, the photos, the video, the audio, if you want all that in the content, where's it going to come from? Are you going to buy it from stock photo or video libraries? Are you going to go out and produce this stuff yourself? Are you going to outsource that element of the production for you so someone else is going out and producing these assets and then you're just going to wrap them up? Any of those approaches will work, but all of them have a cost somewhere in terms of time or money, in terms of making it work. If you are going to do this stuff in-house, particularly, you're going to need some kind of media editing ability. If you're going to shoot video, you can't just take it straight out of the camera, put it in the content. You've got to do something about making sure it's edited properly, that it's the right size, it's shrunk down to the right size to go in the browser and so on. The same with working with audio, all of these things. There's Lots of tools you can get, again, commercial tools, free tools, things like Audacity for working with um, audio. Great stuff, but again, 
Someone's got to learn how to use it. Someone's got to have the time to use it. All of these things have a cost somewhere along the line. And then hardware. So with the media, you may particularly need to spend some money on um, hardware, cameras, microphones, that kind of stuff. But also think about the poor soul that's actually developing the content. So in your organisation, if it happens that everyone's got the same spec PC and everyone's got a screen that's a 1024 by 768 pixels, you can't expect the person developing the content to work on the same screen because he's going to be scrolling backwards and forwards all day around the content because he's got the toolbars. So at the very least, you need to give the guy a bigger browser and probably a faster and more powerful PC. There are organisations that I've worked with recently that have actually invested in buying Apple Macs just for their authoring team. They're actually spending decent money on decent hardware to make the workflow better, which again helps in terms of reducing the, the time issues. So thinking about the people, the whole productivity thing. If you're thinking about any kind of um, internal authoring strategy, there's some really big questions to start with. Is this someone or is this a team of people? Or is this something that someone does alongside their day job? So is this an SME who actually you're expecting to take time out of their job to produce learning content? Well, that's fine, but then there's definitely an issue around productivity in terms of well, their concern probably about being very visible if they've got lots of time to uh, produce content. Or also whether it's a good use of their time in terms of being taken away from the day job to produce content. If you're doing this as a production team, you've got the issue of, well, you're the benefit potentially of having complete control over this. You've got a team of people who you can call on when you want to do what you want. But then you have the problem of the times when it's not busy. What do you do with these people? Well, the biggest challenge you'll probably find is you end up finding them things to do and going out and producing content and things that may even be outside of the field of um, e-learning production just because you want to keep them busy. So you tend to compromise on your initial idea of the benefits of complete control over your in-house production. And it was evident that in all of the organisations that we spoke to, nobody was doing completely solely in-house production. Somewhere along the line, everybody at some point had some degree of flexibility by using external providers, whether it was they actually had um, a, a formal relationship around that kind of um, partially outsourced approach where people were working on different elements of it, or whether it was just, yeah, when we get busy, we can call on Soundset to do this work for us. There was always some kind of get out by using um, an external provider. But say, I think the biggest challenge around productivity is not the keeping people busy, it's the making sure people appear to be busy when it's quiet. Hmm. So there is the, the, the risk, I suppose, that you could just take the things that I've just talked about and think of that as a list of reasons why you shouldn't do this. And that's absolutely not what I want you to go away thinking. Nothing I've talked about is a reason why you shouldn't do this. But everything I talked about is something that you should think about before spending the money, before you go out and buy the tool get the strategy right. From the strategy, work out the development model. From the development model, then think about going out and buying the tool. Don't make the mistake of spending the money in the short term, because it's quite likely that whatever you buy will end up in a desk drawer somewhere, gathering dust and disappointment. And that's me. Thanks very much, Barry. And uh, perfect timing by both.